Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Math with Dr. War. Today we're continuing with part two of the sample task test that I usually give my students every semester. We're now at question seven. Let's begin. Tom has two cubes with one of each number one to six on each of the six faces. He rolls the cubes at the same time and finds the sum of the numbers that show on the top. The sample space of all the possible outcomes is 2, 3, 4, all the way to 12. Which subset describes the possible outcomes for a roll in which one of the cubes shows a number less than or equal to 3? and the other cube shows the number four. Now this question is very wordy and very confusing. It's actually a statistics and probability question. Let's unpack. Now when they say that Tom has two cubes numbered one to six, they actually mean that Tom has two dice. So we all know with a dice, it has the numbers one through six on the faces. Now they're seeing that he rolls the cubes at the same time. So he throws the cubes at the numbers. So suppose Tom throws two ones, one plus one is two. That's where they got the two from. Suppose he throws a one and a two, that would give you a three. So they wrote to all the possible outcomes of what they would get if he throws these two cubes numbered one to six. Now they want us to describe the subset, that is meaning what will be the possible outcomes if Tom throws a cube and one of the cubes shows a number less than or equal to three. So if one of the cubes has numbers less than or equals to three, then it has a one, a two, or a three. So that's one cube. The other cube only has a four. Now remember what it says. It says that he has to find the sum. So guess what? Four plus one is five. Four plus two is six. Four plus three is seven. So we're looking for five, six, and seven as our possible subset. So our answer is C. Question eight is an algebra question. This is quite high emphasis. The price of a certain sofa, S, is 900 more than the price of a chair, C. The total price for the sofa and the chair is $1,200. Which system of equations can be used to find the price of each piece of furniture? So each sentence here describes how we should model our equation. Now I'm going to start with the easiest sentence, which is this one. The total price for the sofa and the chair is $1,200. Now remember, the sofa is S and the chair is C. Please pay attention to the variables that they apply to the item. So the total, we know total means to add. What we're adding, the sofa and the chair. And remember the word is, represents your equal sign, 1200. This is an easy equation to write. So I'm gonna go in to see which of my answer choices has an S plus C equals to 1200. A has that. Okay, we can eliminate B. It has S minus C. Okay, C has the S plus C equals 1200, and the D has a minus. Our answer is either A or C. Now I'm going to go back to the first sentence right here, which says that the price of a certain sofa S, so that's your sofa S, so it says the price of a certain sofa S, there is my S, is my equal sign 
$900 more than the price of a chair. And I always tell my students, when you see that word than, it means the price of the chair, that variable C is first, more than means to add, and we're gonna add 900. So I'm looking for this, S equals C plus 900. And my answer is going to be A. This is high emphasis, so make sure that you can model systems of linear equations. They're not that difficult. It's all about reading. Consider this polynomial expression. X squared minus X plus 1 plus 2X squared plus X minus 9. What is the sum of the polynomials? Now we know sum means to add. I always tell my students when it comes to the polynomials and they want to add or subtract, I say all the time, do one term at a time. So I'm going to start here. So X squared is in the same family as 2X squared. So I have X squared and remember we're adding 2X squared. Remember there's an invisible one here. So the one and the two gives you three X squared. Once I get my three X squared, I'm going to go to my answers and I'm going to eliminate A because that has a one X squared. Okay, I'm gonna to go to my second term. I have negative X. I'm going to add, and this X here is positive. Now when the signs are different, remember we subtract. Again, remember there's some invisible ones here. 1 minus 1 is 0x. When it's 0x, it means your answer is 0. And we don't write 0 because you don't need to. So it means that the x's has been canceled. So you do not have an x variable. We can get rid of c and we can get rid of d. My answer is b. Now, if you want to, you could check the last term, but I don't need to. I have positive 1 and I'm adding negative nine. And remember when you're adding and the signs are different, you subtract and keep the sign of the larger number. So as I said, the X is canceled, so they're gone. So your answer is just three X squared minus eight. Consider this function, F of X equals negative two X plus seven. What is F of negative three? So they gave us our function f of x equals negative 2x plus 7. I need to evaluate f of negative 3. Wherever I see x in my function, I'm going to replace it by its numerical value of negative 3. So I have negative 2 times negative 3 plus 7. Two negatives gives me a positive. So this would be six plus seven, and that is pretty simple. That would give us 13. We now have to bubble our answer into the grid. So again, I'm gonna start here. So I put a one and a three. Writing it at the top will help those folks who are taking their tests in paper form. And then that guides you on how to bubble your answer, one and three. My students are taking their tests on the computer, so a little box will appear and they'll just type in 13. Question 11, the surface area, SA, of a square prism is given by SA equals 2S squared plus 4SH in the equation. S is the length of the side of the square base and H is the height. Which formula could be used to find H if you know the values of S, A, and S. This is what we call a literal equation because your equation is in letters. You have a few numbers, but you have a lot of variables. And they ask us to solve our equation in terms of H. They want us to find H. Now on the task test, this is low emphasis. And I told that to my students because whenever they see this, they get a little bit flustered. Normal linear equation, it's just that you have letters rather than numbers. So I told them, okay, if you have to see, 
I told them, if you see something like this on the task test, just think about what are they asking you to find? So they're asking you to find H right here. I'm going to put a box around it. They're asking us to find H. Think about how you would undo this problem. So if I have to find H, the first thing I'm going to do is to get rid of the 2S squared. So to undo that, since it's positive, I would minus 2S squared from both sides. That is gone. I get SA minus 2S squared equals 4SH. And then I'm going to start going to my answers to look to see where I see an SA minus 2S squared. Number A has a plus sign, so we can eliminate that. Okay, B has a minus. Okay, this has a minus, but uh, ours does not have a minus 4S. And I know my students would keep that there for a while because they're like unsure. And this has an SA minus the 2S, but... Uh, notice they kind of separate the SA from the 2S squared. There's no separation. They are together. So we can eliminate D. Remember who we're solving for, H. Now, if I need to get H by itself, H is connected to the 4 and the S by multiplication. To undo multiplication, you would have to divide. So we will have to divide both sides by 4S. So this cancels, and your H, we're looking for SA minus 2S squared over 4S. So my answer is B. Now we have a word problem. This usually appears in the number and quantity section. While visiting Brazil for six days, Shan has a budget to spend an average of 16 US dollars per day on food. The conversion rate is 1 US dollar equals 3.16 Brazilian real. The first day on vacation, he spends real $63.20. So in Brazilian money, he spent $63.20 on food. What is the average number of US dollars per day Shan can spend on food for the remaining five days of his vacation? I'm going to use the calculator for this section because I have a feeling this will be in the calculator portion because there are a lot of work that we need to do. We know he's going to Brazil for six days and he wants to spend only 16 US a day. So let's find out how much money he has all together. So we would have to take six and times it by 16. That's pretty simple. So I want to just do that in my head. 6 times 6 is 36. 6 times 1 is 6 plus the 3, 96. In the 6 days he's in Brazil, he wants to spend just $96. However, on the first day, he spent $63.20 Brazilian money on food. Let's take that and change it into U.S. money. Now I know that 1 U.S. dollar is three dollars and sixteen cents brazilian so to find out how much us he spent on food i'm going to take the sixty three dollars and twenty cents and let's divide it by three dollars and sixteen cents i'm going to use my calculator for that one so let's see sixty three dollars and twenty cents and let's divide it by the three dollars and sixteen cents notice that both of these values are brazilian so he actually spent 20 US dollars. How much money does he have left? So we're going to take the 96. We're going to subtract the 20. He actually only has 76 US dollars remaining. So out of that 76 dollars, they want to know what is the average number he can spend per day. So how many days does he have left? Five, because he already spent some money on the first day. So we're going to take 76 and we're going to divide that by 5. And let's see how much money that would be. So now going forward, he can only spend $15.20. 
Now I have to enter that into my grid. Um, if I count everything, that's one, two, count the decimal point, three, four, five. And your grid only has five columns. So I'm gonna put everything in. So that's 15.20. So my answer took up every column in the grid. So now I'm going to shade. So I'm shading one, I'm shading five. I need the decimal point. And remember to shade very neatly. And then I need 20 and zero. Again, if you're on the computerized test, you would just type your answer in. And our last question in our sample practice test, select the three expressions that represents a rational number. So again, rationals and irrationals, as I explained to my students, these are considered low emphasis. However, sometimes they throw them in. So I always teach rationals and irrationals the first day of class when I meet my students. So remember, a rational number is an integer. And if you're an integer, it means you're a whole number. And remember, the integers have their negatives and their positives. A rational number is also a fraction. And we don't care what type of fraction. It could be an improper fraction. It can be a proper fraction. It can be a mixed number. It can be a negative fraction. As long as it's a fraction, it is rational. Now your rational numbers can also be decimals, but they have to be terminating decimals, such as 0 0.25, or a decimal with a pattern, such as 0 0.3 with the bar, then we know that it's a rational number. And last but not least, rational numbers are perfect squares. So if I give you the square root of 16, 16 is a perfect number. When you take the square root of 16, you get four. Four is an integer, therefore it's rational. So with all that information, let's find our three rational expressions. Now A, we have a fraction, multiplying a fraction. Remember, fractions are rationals. So a rational times a rational will give you a rational. So let's circle A. B is one over the square root of four. That's one over four is perfect. The square root of four is two. Notice I have a fraction and fractions are rationals. So I can select B. Okay, C, I have two, square root two, square root nine. Okay, now two is a rational number, which you're multiplying by square root two, which is irrational, which I'm multiplying by the square root of nine, which is three, which is irrational. But we all know a rational times an irrational will give you an irrational. And if you multiply it by another rational, you would get an irrational. So we cannot select C. D, I have four square root two times nine. Okay, so I have four, which is rational. Two times nine is 18. So I have a rational number four and I'm multiplying by the square root of 18. 18 is not perfect, which means that the square root of 18 is irrational and a rational times an irrational is irrational. So we're gonna skip D as well. E, we have the square root of four. I know the square root of four is two. And then I have the square root of 16. I know the square root of 16 is four. If I multiply two times four, I get eight. Eight is an integer, therefore it is rational. Or you could have said the square root of four is rational, which you're multiplying by the square root of 16, which is also rational. Therefore, its solution would be rational. So E would make up our third rational expression. If this content has been helpful, please give this video a thumbs up. If you know someone out there who is trying to get their high school diploma and math is a problem, please share this video with them. And as always, comment down below. Your comments are very helpful. Have a great day.